Hello and welcome to Samuel Ramey Behind the Curtain, where we'll be hearing anecdotes about Samuel Ramey's life and career off stage or behind the curtain. I hope you enjoy this series. Hello. Hi. We're back. <laughs> We've. Uh, you're probably all interviewed out after doing your Radio Kansas interview yesterday. Oh no, that was that was pretty short. Yeah, that was pretty short. She, but she wants to do more. You know, she said we hardly got into you, your career or anything. You know, we'll have to do you know several more interviews. So well, that'd be we'll fun, see. wouldn't it? Yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> we often talk about how singers got into the business of singing, you know, how did you get an agent? What did you do? Mm -hmm. But it really goes back much farther. Yeah. It how goes did, back to the beginning. Yeah. Uh, how did you get interested in music for one thing? Things like that. Right. Yeah. And, and so you have to give a big shout out to the uh, public school music teachers mm -hmm. that sort of sparked this interest in young people. Yeah. Um, because not everybody, in fact, probably there are very few people who go into this business who come from a musical family, like uh, professional musicians. Right. Uh, our son, for instance, wants nothing to do with it because he has... He has some strange musical tastes. <laughs> <laughs> Death metal. <laughs> but... Um, he doesn't like to sing in front of us because we're professional singers and it, it's just not where he's going to, that's not where he's going. No, <laughs> no, I don't think so. No. So, he used to do a good Janis Joplin all years ago. Yeah. And a good <laughs> Freddie Mercury. Yeah. 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 But there are a lot of musical children out there who maybe wouldn't even know that they had musical ability mm -hmm. if they weren't exposed to it. Right. And that's why music programs in the public schools are so important. And of course, music programs are the first things that get cut mm -hmm. when there are budget cuts. Yeah, music and art. Yep. Yeah, it's very unfortunate because you're not getting a well-rounded right. education without that. Yeah. So, God, God forbid we you know make any cuts in this. In the sports department, you know. <laughs> Shh. <laughs> Sorry. Let's talk about your early beginnings. Okay. I mean, how does a boy who grew up in Colby, Kansas, your dad was a meat cutter, your mom at that time was a, a housewife. A housewife. How did you get interested in music? Well, I don't. I can't really remember how my interest was first peaked in music. Um, <clears throat> I mean, I I think it probably has to do with music classes and in, in school in the lower grades. Um, I can remember it in the, you know, the lower grades, first grade, second grade, third grade, fourth grade, you know, I can remember them, you know, the music teacher used to come to the, come to the room and, you know, you'd sing songs and You'd learn the scales and like that, and and I I do remember though that when it came time for for grades to be issued any time, uh, we had to, for music we had to, everybody had to get up and sing a solo of their choice, you know, just a song. So uh, I can remember I remember doing that, learning learning songs, and um, I can remember that. I used to stifle because my voice, when I was very young, I had a, a really fabulous voice soprano voice, <laughs> if you don't mind my saying so. <laughs> and um, <clears throat> but I can remember whenever I would get up to sing these songs, I would always stifle my vibrato because I didn't want people to think I was weird. <laughs> So that was in grade school? That was in the lower grades, yeah. And then eventually we <clears throat> moved from Colby to Quint Quinter, Kansas, and others very much smaller than Colby, uh, if, you know, if that's possible. Um, 
And uh, we'd had a very, really nice music teacher there. I only remember her name as Mrs. Jones. <laughs> but uh, we did I, we did a musical one year when I was either seventh or eighth grade. I can't remember. It had a. I remember that song. I I I I. Was from that musical. <laughs> what if, I don't know. I don't remember anything about it. Um, <clears throat> but I remember we, you know, we did that. We did that musical, and I, I grew my hair long for the first time for that musical. <laughs> and then um, I know that you had a teacher in high school that yes. was very instrumental in mm -hmm. your continuing. Yeah. In music. Yeah. Then we, <clears throat> after my, um, I think, in my freshman in high school year, we moved back to Colby. Um, I remember my parents moved um, because my dad had heart issues, and so he could not, he could no longer do the meat cutting business because he had to haul, and you know, he had to carry a big heavy sides of beef out of the locker and you know he mm -hmm. couldn't do that anymore so he got an office job as um, the deputy county deputy sheriff so anyway we moved back to Colby and um, yeah we had a my music teacher in high school was a, a, a lady at that time named Kay Patterson and uh, she she was very instrumental I think in in, in piquing my interest, you know, but she, she w w tried to, you know, do things for, for the kids, you know, like she had a special, she organized a special music appreciation class that for, for anybody who wanted to take it, which was, which was very nice, you know, she'd play recordings of all the great composers and everything. And I took, you know, some voice lessons from her as well. And um, it, it was really nice because then she got married and her name was Kay Hedges and she moved to Oklahoma City. But she used to turn up if whenever I would come anywhere near, you know, in the Midwest someplace, she would, she and her husband would turn up at my recitals and things. So it was always nice. It was always nice to see her. Uh, and I, but she... She passed away about I don't know, five or six years ago, I think, something like that. I mean, that's she's the one that you know really got me interested in music, and and um, she helped get me. She had graduated from Kansas State University when she came to Colby, and um, um, she put me in touch with the people there, and I I went to. Um, summer music camps at Kansas State University. I think I went there two, two summers in my late high school years. And, uh, and that eventually led to them giving me some, a small scholarship when I, when I decided to go to K-State and, and take, and study music. They, they gave me a very, a very small, very small scholarship, but you know, every little bit helped back then. Right. <laughs> Still does. Yes. yes. <laughs> Yeah, where are those scholarships now? <laughs> <laughs> scholarships for old singers. <laughs> right. Exactly. Yeah. So, like you said, you did go to K State mm -hmm. uh, briefly. Briefly. One went, year. Uh, a year and a half. Okay. Uh, and did you take voice lessons while you were there? Took voice lessons. Yes, of course. I took voice lessons. Uh, my voice teacher was a man named William Fisher. He was sort of the, he was the choral man and, and the main male voice teacher um, there. And um, yeah, he was fine. And then he was, he had a group. He, had, he formed a group called the K-State Singers. And um, <clears throat> they were sort of an elite group. And uh, whenever we, whenever they went on choir tour, <clears throat> the K-State singers would always perform for like a half an hour during the, the main concert choirs, concerts, and um, singing more popular type music. Um, um, so 
I got into K-State Singers my my uh, my last semester, so um, uh, that was fun. And he was quite a great performer. You know, he he did a lot of solo work with the, on the K-State Singer with the K-State Singers, conducting, and that he would do a few solo numbers. He was he was very good, very good performer. So, who gave you the idea of auditioning for Central City? Well. That that came. I I got interested in opera at K State because my teacher had me working, put me to work at one point on on Non Più and Dry from Figaro, and I think I've told the story that I went out and he said I should maybe find a recording and listen to it just to get an idea of the style and thing. And I so I went out and found an old LP of Ezio Pinza, and. Um, and so that that sort of got my interest in opera going because I used to go to the library and listen to operas, you know, opera recordings, and and uh, and then uh, there was uh, in my hometown. I, I laid out of school one one semester and was working in my hometown, and um, I did some uh, I did some work with not work, you know, just for fun. With the local theater, and um, we did some um, melodramas one summer. And um, <clears throat> but anyway, the head of that was he was the he ran the extension office of Kansas University in Colby, and but he he was he had a lot of knowledge of theater and. Um, uh, music. He knew he he knew opera, and he had some recordings. So you know, groups of us used to go over, and we did usually end up. He would play play some opera um, at the end of a party, you know, and we'd listen, and uh, and uh, so that's that sort of piqued my interest. And then he told me about the Central City Opera in Colorado, that um, he thought that they they hired young singers. To sing in the chorus, do the chorus, and uh, they had a, a small sort of not really a young artist program, but the chorus kids, you know, had a work a sort of a workshop, and they did a little concert of scenes at the end of the summer. And um, so anyway, I found out how to uh, that I had to make a tape, so I went out to my in Colby in my local radio station K Triple X, <laughs> and uh, they let me use a room. And uh, I can't remember who played for me. I don't remember. Somebody played the piano for me, and I sang a couple of. Uh, I think I sang in Diesen Heilig in Holland from Magic Flute and and something else, um, and sent the tape off. and And lo and behold, I heard not too long after that they they liked me, and so they they hired me. They took me to to be to go out there and be in the chorus, uh, Central City Opera. And this would have been the, the summer of 1963. So I went out to Central City and was rehearsing and taking part in operas before I had ever seen an opera on the stage. <laughs> and the operas that summer were Don Giovanni and Il Trovatore. And uh, some wonderful singers were there that summer. Um, the two Don Giovannis were Norman Tregel and Richard Crofts. Um, Leporellos were Herbert Beatty and Spiro Malas. Um, Commendatores were Thomas Paul and Justino Diaz. Justino Diaz had just won the Met auditions that previous spring in 1963, and had, and so he was going to be start singing at the Met, and he was. 22 to 20 years old. He was not very, he was just a little older than me, I remember. <laughs> he was way ahead of me. <laughs> and when you heard him sing and knew his age, did you think, well, why can't I do that? Well, yeah, a little bit. Yeah. Oh, to be I mean, young and naive. My, yeah, my voice was nowhere near as mature sounding as 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 was his but uh, <laughs> certainly had a great influence on me that's yeah. for sure it was there that you met some wichita state university yeah 
there were a couple of um, <clears throat> a couple of people in the in the uh, Central City course that summer who were students here at Wichita State, and um, you know, and I had I was debating about I had, didn't know what I was for sure what I was going to do the next year because I had dropped out. I had left Kansas State University, and um, what made you do that? Well, um, it was finances. My my father had passed away. Um, it, it was you know mostly financial things. Uh, just had to save up some money. I didn't, I didn't have any money. <laughs> <laughs> so um, so I they they the, these two two girls uh, Sharon Stevens and I can't remember the other girl's name. Sharon will remind me if I if she, she if she be. sees this interview she'll remind we'll send me. Send her a link. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and they they sort of ta started talking up Wichita State. You should oh you should come to Wichita State. You know we have an excellent music department and a you know wonderful um, opera department. And so I decided that that's what I would do. I transferred and uh, transfer my everything to Wichita State and start there in the fall of. 1963. And how did you find your voice teacher at Wichita State, or did they just assign you to somebody? Um, I ended up studying with um, the teacher that uh, that Sharon and that Sharon had. That Sharon was was studying studying with. Her name was Inez Jameson. So I I studied with her for a year, and then I decided I wanted a, a you know a, a male teacher. Um, so on the faculty was also a man named Arthur Newman. Now Arthur Newman had been years before, some years before, um, the, a charter, one of the charter members of the old New York City Center Opera, which became New York City Opera when it was first formed in 1943. So he was one of the original company members. So he used to talk talk up the New York City all the time, New York City Opera, when, when I studied with him. And so I sort of had, had, had my goal when I eventually left Wichita State. I had a goal in my mind. I wanted to sing at New York City Opera. <laughs> and how did that turn out? Well. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> After I finished uh, at Wichita State, I uh, I had a short stint with. Uh, we talked about the formerly the Grassroots Opera, the National Opera Company. Right after I finished um, my college, um, went from there from Wichita down there to uh, Raleigh, North Carolina, and sang with them for that that spring of 1969. And uh, after that, I went, I decided that, uh, that uh, I would go to New York and uh, further my studies in New York. So went back to Colby and packed up all my stuff and got on the Greyhound bus in Colby and <laughs> went to New York. I had stayed with some friends that, uh, that I had met with the Grassroots Opera temporarily until and then, actually, then I moved in with <clears throat> another uh, another singer who had been at Wichita State. Um, he's, we, he, we sang a couple of operas together at Wichita State. His name was Don Juno, and he had an had an apartment um, on uh, West Seventy Third Street in New York, and uh, so he offered uh, to let me come and. And uh, stay in one of the, one of the bedrooms in that in his apartment for a while, and uh, so I that I did that, and and uh, then I met my what would become my second wife. Not that, me. Not not you. No. <laughs> and she she had an apartment in on West Eighty Second Street, which uh, I lived uh, that we lived there for yeah five or six years. Um, were you paying rent to various people though, that you were living with? Yes. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> you weren't just a freeloader. No, I wasn't a freeloader. I you was, got your nine to five job. Yeah, I got my 
Yeah, when I first came to New York, when I was <clears throat> when I was staying in Don Juno's apartment, um, uh, I went went out on interviews for jobs, and eventually got a got a job at a, uh, a book publishing company called Academic Press. They published scientific and medical textbooks. Um, so I was, and I was a copywriter. So uh, you know the little blurbs that they sometimes put on the on the inside of the cover for the book, little you know blurbs about the book. And so we wrote we wrote those. I mean, it's not very it wasn't very creative because the, they would always send the author who was going to be, I mean, the man who was going to write the book. They'd send him a questionnaire about it, and we'd use the information he sent back to to put together a, a you know a blurb. Yeah. <laughs> so when you got to New York, uh, how long did it take you to find a voice teacher there? Well, <clears throat> there again, I had a number of friends who had preceded me to from Wichita State to New York. Um, there was a girl named Jana Stinson um, and, uh, well, and Sharon Stevens and uh, Don Juno. These were all people that I had gone to Wichita State with and they had gone to New York after they finished their schooling. So, so, um, <laughs> so they were all, they were all studying with, um, with the same teacher. Her name was Herta Sperber, and um, so I, I, I auditioned for her, and I, and I went, I studied with her for, oh, the better part of a, I think a year, and, um, but she was a, a, a very good teacher, a wonderful teacher, um, but I wasn't happy with the direction she was taking. She wanted. She wanted to take take me in the direction of singing a lot of Wagner and uh, things like that. So, and at that point, I wasn't interested in that very much. And so, I decided to change teachers. And I had heard about a man named Armin Boyajian, and I had a <clears throat> I had a church job, a church job and a synagogue job. I sang in church on Sunday and the synagogue on Friday evening. So, but the, and in this synagogue choir, there was a tenor who studied with uh, Armin Boyajian. So I asked him if he could um, help me with, a, recommend me or to, to, to do an audition for him. And so he did and I auditioned for uh, Armin. I remember I went I think it was it was election day of 1970. I don't know why I remember that, <laughs> but I went to Armin that day and auditioned for him, and uh, and he took me. So and uh, the rest is history. <laughs> that was your last voice teacher. That was my last voice teacher. Yes, he's he's still my voice teacher. <laughs> yeah. So other, besides voice teachers, there is another element to. Uh, preparing for a career mm -hmm. in opera, certainly, um, you need to know good coaches. Yes. And I know that often, depending on the school you go to, undergrad institutions don't always have professional coaches right. available right. to yeah. singers. I know when I went to St. Olaf College, uh, the, that was the first time that I experienced an, somebody who knew how to coach because Tim Plombeck, mm -hmm. uh, who later on went on to coach for a while at Lyric Opera, and now he teaches at Lake Forest Academy, and he was, I think, at University of Michigan uh, getting his degree in coaching. Mm -hmm. And he came back and he prepared me for my junior recital oh. and it was like night and day mm -hmm. having a pianist who could work with you on the phrasing languages style 
it's not that my voice teacher didn't know mm -hmm. about all of that, yep. but your voice teacher really wants to take that small amount of time they have with you every week to work on your technique, your vocal yep. technique. Right. So this was an eye-opening experience. And um, for so for any young singers who are studying, if you don't have a coach at your university, if you're in a big enough city where coaches are available, find a coach. Yeah. It's you know more money, of course, that you're putting out, but it's worth it. Find a coach to work with you on your repertoire um, and work with them as often as you're working with your voice teacher, you yep. know, at yep. least once exactly. a week. Because it, it turns your musical performance from being accurate into being truly musical mm -hmm. and dramatic. Right. So when did you first start work, working with coaches? Well, I started not too long um, after, um, after I started with Armin. I mean, Armin was a very good coach too, but, but, but he was extremely busy in those days of teaching. So um, there was one lady I used to uh, I used to work with a bit. I cannot remember her name, but I actually got some work through working with her at one point. Early in the early in 1972, I had been you know working with her on. I'd go and work on arias and things if I had auditions or of anything coming up and and. Um, <clears throat> So she told me one day that that um, Sarah Caldwell had called her. Sarah Caldwell at that time was she was a, a head of the uh, Boston Lyric Opera at the time. Was a, she was a conductor, um, and so uh, Sarah Caldwell called her and uh, I guess she used to periodically call her because she knew she worked with young singers and she was always looking for young <laughs> inexpensive singers to <laughs> to do small parts with the Boston Opera. I got a call from from Sarah Caldwell actually and saying that she had spoken to I can't remember the piano the coach's name unfortunately she said and we and uh, I was, I was just looking for, for um, you know, so we're doing a production of La Traviata, and I'm, I'm looking for um, somebody to sing the Doctor, Doctor Granville, and um, she recommended you, and so anyway, that's how I, I got my first one. It was one of my first jobs, uh, professional jobs. Went up, went up to Boston and sang Doctor Granville with. Beverly Sills and <laughs> Stuart Burroughs and Peter Glossop were the main male were the main leads of the production, and uh, yeah, like that. So yeah, the coaches are very, 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 very important. And then after, um, I, I I remember I started writing. I wrote a letter to. New York City Opera asking to offer an audition because you could do that because then a city opera would would hear anybody that expressed an interest in singing for them. Uh, so I wrote them a letter and they had me come and one day and I sang down in the basement of the State Theater in the orchestra room, wonderful room to sing in, <laughs> not. Um, <laughs> the all acoustical tile everywhere. Um, so anyway, that was that was my first audition for New York City Opera, and then they would call me periodically um, and ask me to come and sing on stage, which, which you know, I would go down and sing on stage, and uh, I did I don't know four or five of those auditions before they finally hired me, <laughs> and. Um, so, but then when I started singing at City Opera, they had a very fine music staff there of coaches. So I used to, you know, work with as many of them as uh, as possible, and like that, how my coaching started. 
So early exposure to music mm -hmm. is key for people like yeah. Samuel Ramey. From Colby, Kansas. Yeah, to have gotten into the world of opera. I mean, talent, obviously, and hard work mm -hmm. is what got you to the level. One would like to hope so, anyway. <laughs> and he does work very hard. He has always worked very hard yes. on languages, on style, on, you know, mm -hmm. notes. Yes. Yeah, and your relationship with coaches never ends. <laughs> it never ends, and you know what? The, it's They're great relationships to have. Yeah, yeah. And a lot of coaches are also rehearsal accompanists at opera companies. Yeah. And some of those also go on to become conductors. So... Or a professional accompanist. Yeah. Like yeah. my... My accompanist, Warren Jones, I first started working with him when I was, I had a, I had a, an agreement to do at the Paris Opera, the opera Robert Le Diable of Meyerbeer. And uh, I was, I, you know, I didn't know who would know that opera. You know, it's not, it was at that time was not an opera that was done very much at all. So um, I asked uh, Marilyn Horn, if she could recommend a coach to work on, on this on this opera, and she recommended Warren Jones. <laughs> she said he's been at the Met, he's been on the staff at the Met, and he's a he's a fabulous coach. He knows all the languages. So I, I started. I worked with him. Warren taught me Robert Le Diable, <laughs> and that's how our relationship started because he hadn't gotten into accompanying yet. He hadn't, you know, he was always interested in, he wanted to be uh, uh, an accompanist for singers, and uh, and so I can remember him after we worked for a while on Robert Le Diable, he, he said, are you are you going to, he asked me one day, I remember that, are you going to um, do, uh, you know, recital work at some point? And, and I said, well, I said, my agent keeps talking about um, maybe setting some time aside to and they'd like to book me in doing some recitals. And he said, well, when, if and when you, you start, he said, would you think of me as your accompanist? And I said, so I, I did. And Warren is <laughs> Yeah, one of the fabulous. best, one of the, <laughs> one of the greats. Yeah. yeah, keep those good relationships with mm -hmm. your accompanists and, um, and appreciate those teachers in grade school, yeah. middle school, high school that work so hard to spark that creativity in mm -hmm. the kids because yeah. without that who knows what happens to classical <laughs> music. Right. So, all right, well, honey, thank you for My talking about My your early, early days with yeah. us. <laughs> and we hope you enjoyed it, and uh, hopefully it won't be several months before we come back again. No, I don't think it will. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> all right, bye-bye. Bye. Regina, they're the